Josephus was a Judeo-Roman historian. He was born in about 37 AD in Jerusalem where he spent his early life. He fought on the Jewish side in the Judeo-Roman War of 66-70 to AD as a commander of Jewish forces in Galilee, surrendering to the Romans in 67 AD as they swept through Galilee on the way to Jerusalem from Syria. The Roman forces were commanded by Vespasian. The captured Josephus cunningly claimed that Jewish prophecies predicted that Vespasian would become emperor. Vespasian may have been influenced by this prediction, but in any event he took Josephus as a slave and interpreter. Vespasian did indeed become emperor in 69 AD and granted Josephus his freedom. Josephus then took Vespasian's family name of Flavius. Vespasian's son Titus commanded the Roman army that besieged Jerusalem. The siege ended with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Josephus accompanied Titus as his translator on this campaign. He returned to Rome in 71 AD with Titus and began to write his historical works. Antiquities of the Jews was his largest. It is a huge work in 20 volumes, totalling 480,000 surviving words. It describes the ancient history of the Jewish people and about half of it is concerned with the 1st century AD. It contains two short passages referring to Jesus. It refers to a total of either seven or eight individuals called Jesus, depending on which arguments about the two Jesus Christ passages you accept. In Book 18, Chapter 3, Josephus describes an uprising of Jews over a hydrological engineering project to bring water to Jerusalem that Pilate had funded with their sacred money. Pilate responded to the angry crowd by sending soldiers in plain clothes with concealed weapons amongst them. Then on his signal they attacked the unarmed crowd. Many were killed and many more wounded, and the sedition was thus crushed. The paragraph following this description is the famous Testimonium Flavianum. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had him condemned to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold, these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. Now as Josephus was not a Christian, he cannot have written those things that only a Christian would write. The earliest manuscript we have dates from the 11th century and is a Christian copy, so presumably Christian scribes inserted these details. Consequently, the current scholastic consensus is that what Josephus actually wrote was more like this. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. It has been argued that the whole thing is a later Christian interpolation. There are several grounds for this. Firstly, none of it is mentioned by any Christian authors until the 4th century, though it's not clear what advantage earlier Christian authors would have got from the rather bland reconstructed original shown here, as they were concerned with defending Jesus' divinity rather than his humanity. The second reason is that the passage after this begins, About this same time, also another sad calamity put the Jews into disorder, and certain shameful practices happened about the Temple of Isis that was at Rome. I will now first take notice of the wicked attempt about the Temple of Isis and will then give an account of the Jewish affairs. This appears to be the introduction of another calamity in a list of calamities that befell the Jews and would follow naturally from the calamity over the hydrological engineering of Pilate and not so naturally from the advertisement for Jesus. But as we will see, Josephus was not averse to diversions. Following that passage, Josephus spends a thousand words describing a story that I have to recommend. It is a salacious tale of a love triangle in which a young man is besotted by a beautiful, virtuous and rich married woman who is devoted to the Egyptian religion. A plot is hatched involving money and deception in which the priests of the temple of Isis in Rome conspire to tell the woman that the god Anubis desires her. She spends a night in the temple with a person she believes to be the god Anubis, who I quote, did not fail of enjoying her but it was actually the besotted young man who confessed to her three days later. Emperor Tiberius got wind of the matter, had the high priest crucified, the temple destroyed, and the statue of Isis cast into the river Tiber. 
Sorry for that aside, but how could I resist? An ideal story for a movie. Anyway, Josephus finally gets to the point. Four Jewish rogues had persuaded a respected local lady to send gifts of gold and purple to the temple in Jerusalem. They embezzled the gifts. Tiberius got to hear of it and conscripted 4,000 Jews into the army and sent them to Sardinia and kicked the rest out of Rome. So personally, I don't find this argument from follow-on particularly convincing. But in the end, that comes down to a matter of opinion. The second and final reference Josephus makes to Jesus occurs in Book 20, Chapter 9. Here, Josephus recounts how a certain recently appointed high priest called Ananus was insolent, bold of temper, and a stickler for the Jewish law. He took advantage of the temporary absence of higher authorities from Jerusalem and assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. This did not go down well, and resulted in King Agrippa booting him out of the high priesthood, giving it instead to Jesus, son of the former high priest Damnus. This second passage has also been contested by Richard Carrier, who argues that who was the Christ was an accidental inclusion of an ancient reader's margin note into the main text by a Christian scribe, and that the Jesus mentioned was actually Jesus, son of high priest Damnus. Well, maybe, but Josephus usually puts his qualifiers after the first appearance of the new name and then drops the qualifiers later in the passage rather than the other way round. I suppose it could have been a more cynical Christian editing in which the original qualifier to the first appearance of Jesus was replaced with who was the Christ and this qualifier was then added to the second appearance of Jesus in the passage but this is, I think, a bit of a stretch. While these objections are not without merit, they are not conclusive. Personally, I prefer the scholastic consensus, but you decide. But, even if these mentions of Jesus by Josephus are genuine, where did he get his information? Josephus was born in 37 AD and lived in Jerusalem for around 30 years. It's entirely possible that he interviewed eyewitnesses to a historical Jesus, but it's also possible that he did not. He began his historical works after the fall of Jerusalem when working in Rome after 71 AD. It's therefore equally possible that his information originated from Christian sources during the period of mythicist historicization. In the Testimonium Flavianum he mentions Christians, but no dates or secular sources. The upshot is that the evidence from Josephus may be forged or may be genuine. And if genuine, it may or may not originate from Christian sources dating from after 70 AD. So does this help us discriminate between the mythicist and historicist positions? Not really. In the next video, I'll turn to Tacitus. But don't hold your breath. His evidence is no better.